Welcome all to today's webinar about how to design a New York City fuel oil system. John Haver and Ed Twist, two system engineers from Analytical and Combustion Systems, will be presenting the webinar today. John Haber and Ed Twist combined have over 50 years of experience designing fuel oil systems and have designed over a thousand fuel oil systems worldwide. We offer one professional development hour credit for the viewing of this webinar. If you would like to receive this credit, you must register for the webinar, sign in via your given logon information, and watch the webinar in its entirety. After the webinar, we will be sending out certificates to your office. If you are viewing this webinar after it is live on September 26th, unfortunately you are not eligible for the PDH credit. John and Ed also present live in-person lunch and learns with available PDH credit. If you would like them to come to your office, you can email them at the email address above and set up a time and date with them. This webinar will be on YouTube afterwards. You can find it by searching for Preferred Utilities on YouTube and then searching for Designing a New York City Fuel Oil System. Once again, we'd like to thank Analytical and Combustion Systems System Engineers John Haber and Ed Twist for coming and presenting today. Off to you, Ed and John. Good day, all. I am Ed Twist. And I am John Haber. We are with Analytical and Combustion Systems here to present on boiler and generator fuel oil pumping and distribution. We will be having a live question and answer session at the end of the webinar. However, if you have any quick questions, you can use the chat box during the webinar. Otherwise, please feel free to email us directly. Off to you, Ed. Thank you, John. The goal of this presentation is to provide an overview of fuel oil handling systems. We will discuss basic topics and applications, including fuel oil system layout, fuel oil pumping basics, pump types and characteristics, fuel oil systems applications for emergency generators and boilers and burners, pump set selection, fuel oil system design, and something becoming more and more critical, the long-term storage of fuel oil, especially with low sulfur, ultra low sulfur, and biofuels. And a couple of uh, points here is on strategy, I mean, there's a, a large range that we can discuss at future times um, and also when we talk about low sulfur fuels and uh, ultra low sulfur and bio I mean there's a lot of water in those molecules Ed right so yes really you have to play pay close attention to how much storage you have in the facility and you know the realization that you really do want to um, filter and you need to filter and, and polish water it. you need to filter and polish and dewater it because the, uh, the those old high sulfur fuels had uh, antibiotics in them the new low sulfur fuels do not this slide pictures most of the equipment that you might find in a fuel oil system and is a good road map here we can see underground tanks above ground tanks and their ancillary equipment some specialties you may not find in chilled or hot water systems, such as item 10, an anti-siphon valve, item number 9, a tank selector valve, and item 27, a fire safety lever gate valve, which will be discussed in more detail later. Probably the most critical aspect of a fuel oil system is getting the oil to the pump. Unlike chilled or hot water systems, which are pressurized by expansion tanks, Fuel oil systems typically operate in a vacuum on the suction side of the pump. For this reason, NPSH is critical. NPSHA, net positive suction head available, is a function of the system. You as designers have influence on this based on elevation changes, pipe routing, and sizing and number of fittings. NPSHR, the net positive suction head required, is a function of the pump. This is the pressure required at the inlet of the pump to prevent the pump from cavitating. When the NPSHA is less than the NPSHR, we have cavitation. Cavitation occurs when the liquid is reduced to the vapor pressure of the fluid at the actual temperature. This reduces efficiency and damages the pump. For this reason, your NPSHA must always be greater than the NPSHR to prevent cavitation. Hi, Ed. Have you ever heard a pump cavitate? Yeah, it sounds like we're grinding up a bunch of marbles in that pump, and you hear it from, you hear it from uh, all the way down the hallway. doesn't sound very good. Yeah, I think it tends to 
have people want to head for the door. Especially in a high-end hotel. Not very good. Well, you know, this slide is a great representation of a demonstration of cavitation occurring in a uh, rotary gear pump, which is typically used in a fuel oil system. Those little vortexes there are your fluid flashing. It's quite unique uh, to be able to just see that discoloration uh, with the swirl at the uh, exit of the, of the gears after they mesh. And it's pretty hard to believe that those little vortexes can actually eat away metal, huh? Just imagine they're running for 10 hours like this. Oh, yeah. You know? To prevent cavitation, we must stay above the vapor pressure line. In a fuel oil system, operating in a vacuum condition on the suction side of a pump, we end up with an elevated vapor pressure line which facilitates cavitation in an improperly designed system. Why positive displacement pumps? Positive displacement pumps are the pump of choice of fuel oil. They are able to pump viscous liquids. They provide lift, constant flow over a wide range of operating pressures, and are self-priming to a point. The pump flow is determined by motor RPM and Pump pressure is determined by the motor horsepower. Also, positive displacement pumps are required by code for fuel oil transfer pumps. And the other thing about positive displacement pumps is actually per code in New York City and actually the international code. Correct. For fuel burning devices, um, you have to have positive displacement pumps. That is correct, yeah. This slide is a comparison of positive displacement pumps and centrifugal pumps. The performance graph shows the capacity versus head. As you can see, the positive displacement pump has a constant flow rate over a wide range of operating pressures. The centrifugal pump flow rate reduces as the head increases. The efficiency of a positive displacement pump is constant also over a wide range of operating conditions. For a centrifugal pump, you must design for the best efficiency point, which is the peak of the curve. Viscosity up to a point increases the flow rate of a positive displacement pump. For instance, the flow rate for number six oil is higher than the flow rate for number two oil. Centrifugal pumps will not pump viscous fluids. Examples of positive displacement pump curves. When you ask us for curves, you'll get a bunch of straight lines. As you can see, the speed of the pump determines the flow rate. The higher the RPM, the higher the flow rate. And as you can see, the flow rate changes very little over the, the operating pressures. This slide is in reference to pump inlet suction guidelines. Getting the oil into the pump is the hard part. The positive displacement pumps will positively pump the oil to the destination. Best practice is to keep the pumps as close to the tank as possible. Try to avoid excessive suction lengths and inversions. Suction pipe sizing is critical when sizing. Quality positive displacement pumps will create 20 inches of vacuum. We like to design systems with a pump vacuum with less than 15 inches mercury. As a rule of thumb, pumps will work for buried tanks with a max lift of 20 feet from the tank bottom to the pump inlet. Although code calls for a pressure test on the piping, we also recommend a vacuum test on the suction side of the piping. Determining inlet suction. Determine gravity head in feet of oil. Figure the lift from the bottom of the tank to the pump inlet. Convert your fittings, your valves, your length of pipes, add your losses through the strainer. And by the way, we like to size our strainers at a half inch mercury pressure drop through a clean basket. If your losses are too high, increase your diameter. And pay close attention to the suction line sizing, number of fittings, routing. Do not oversize, and what I mean is, sometimes you get too conservative and you increase your pipe diameter, and if you have a very low pump flow rate, and perhaps you have a buried tank, sometimes it's nearly impossible to pull a prime out of that tank if you have a 100 gallon an hour pump using a four inch suction line that has a dozen elbows and the tank is buried three feet below grade. As John says, it really is critical to pay attention to the uh, suction pipe sizing. 
is it critical to the system operation? And typically, I like to see the, um, the velocity in the pipe somewhere around two feet per second or less. Types of pumps we use in the industry, <clears throat> they're all positive displacement type as required by code. The first is the internal gear pump. We typically recommend for smaller systems. Our range of use is 20 gallons an hour to 1,000 gallons an hour with discharge pressures up to 100 PSI. Spur gear pumps we typically recommend for medium range systems, 200 gallons an hour to 30 GPM with pressures up to 300 PSI. And then we have a rotary screw type pump we typically recommend for large central heating plants, data centers, hospitals, anything high end, uh, that range of 20 GPM to 80 GPM and up to 500 PSI. Fuel oil systems applications. We have uh, fuel oil boiler loops at high or low pressure. We have generator systems utilizing remote day tanks or belly tanks or headers. Most common uh, duplex pump skids will have 100% redundancy. Other types of systems are triplex pump skids or jockey pumps where there may be a farm tank of oil, a uh, farm of oil tanks and they like to move the oil around. There are return pumps and there are filtration systems with oil pumps. In New York City, it's uh, one note is that you are not allowed to use uh, return pumps on day tanks. Right, and sometimes uh, the riser piping goes up to the ceiling and then it enters your, your generator room and you have to drop down 10 or 12 feet to a belly tank and that kind of poses a problem uh, for the installation. Boiler supply loop systems. Cast iron and fire tube boilers are typically supplied with burners with integral fuel oil pumps. These pumps by code are positive displacement pumps, similar to what we provide on our pump sets. They will always pump a constant volume. These pumps are always oversized, one and a, one and a half times at a minimum of the consumption rate. A five gallon per hour burner might have a 45 gallon per hour pump. Care must be taken when sizing a transfer pump for multiple burners as the pump rate is significantly higher than the burn rate. Low pressure boiler loop. Burners with integral pumps are piped in low pressure loop per NFPA 31, which only allows 3 PSIG on the inlet of the burner pumps. In this example, we are drawing, a fuel, oil, we are drawing fuel oil out of a tank and feeding two burners with integral pumps. The burners burn 100 gallons per hour and the pumps are rated at 250 gallons per hour each. In the example, the transfer pump would be sized for the burn rate of the first burner and the pump rate of the second burner. So 100 plus 250 equals 350 gallons per hour and applying a safety factor of 1.5 to 2 would equate to a transfer pump size for 525 to 700 gallons per hour. In a low pressure loop, Use the pump rate of the last burner and the burn rate of all upstream burners. We like to always pump slightly uphill and put an inverted U at the end of the line to add a slight back pressure and to ensure the supply pipe is flooded with no air as the storage tank acts as an air separator. High pressure boiler loops are used to feed large industrial boilers. These boilers are equipped with burners that do not have pumps. These burners typically require 100 to 200 PSIG supply pressure. Since there are no pumps, we are just concerned with the burn rate. Therefore, we size a transfer pump for the total plant burn rate times the safety factor of 1.5 to 2. We will use a back pressure regulating valve at the end of the line to set the pressure for the burners. So Ed, I wonder if anybody's asking, uh, how come there isn't a return line off of those burners back to the oil tank return line? Well, since there's no pumps on there, we're not pumping more, we're not forcing, or pumping or forcing more oil into the uh, nozzle of the burner, so therefore there's no oil to be returned to the, uh, to the, to the main fuel oil supply pipe there. Uh, there are occasions, though, where they actually will put a scavenger pump on there when a burner is uh, being pulled out of service, they can just pump the residual oil out of it. Day tanks. Day tanks are used for emergency generators boilers, and other fuel burning devices. 
used for remote limited supply at fuel burning device and decouples the appliance pump from the main transfer pump on the bottom floor. We recommend a two to four hour storage at the remote device. Use drop tubes to prevent foaming problems. The return pipe can be extended at least half the distance to the bottom of the tank. For good circulation space, supply and return piping as far apart as possible, each near the bottom of the tank. And you must have a means to prevent overfilling. Day tank piping considerations. System design determined by either generator consumption or pump flow rate. Similar to boilers, there could be a large difference between the generator burn rate versus actual pumping rate. A good rule of thumb is each 100 kW of generator capacity will consume 7 gallons per hour. Generators that are piped with return line back to the day tank require a smaller flow rate as the transfer pump set is sized for consumption. Generators with return piped directly back to the main tank require larger transfer pumps. Try to avoid small day tanks on large generators as the recirculated return oil could overheat the small day tank. Note the flash point of diesel oil is approximately 138 degrees Fahrenheit and generators typically have a shutdown sensor at a, between 140 and 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Remedies for keeping day tank supply fuel oil cool. Install a fuel oil cooling radiator to prevent overheating. Return directly to the main tank bypassing the day tank. Or if, a pro if possible, increase your day tank capacity. Then you determine your duty cycle of the pump set. Typically, on taller buildings, the rule of thumb is four to one. Um, and this could be buildings at 30 stories up. Sometimes with three or four or 10 story buildings, you may only use a duty factor of three to one. So John, how long has that seven gallons per 100 kW rule of thumb been used? Since the cavemen. That's pretty long. <laughs> Didn't, they gener didn't know they had generators back then, maybe <laughs> mid-1990s? The seven-gallon rule per 100 kW has been around uh, since I started in the mid-90s, so it's been around a lot longer yeah, than and, me. And pretty accurate, right? Very accurate. Uh, this is a representation of a typical New York City generator installation. The main oil tank is in the basement with the pump skid, and the day tank is located up at the generator on the upper level. This shows the generator return line piped back to the day tank. Therefore, the pump skid will be sized for consumption. The static head and piping losses will determine the discharge pressure of the pump skid. The overflow pipe per code must be two standard pipe sizes larger than the supply pipe. The maximum storage per floor above the lowest floor of a building in New York City is 330 gallons and the roof is considered a floor of the building. The day tank must be vented locally to atmosphere and you can install a T in the vent line and connect that line to the overflow line going back to the basement tank. We also recommend a switch in that vent line just in case uh, the oil is going up that line you'd like to know that's an issue. Be sure to keep supply and return lines as far apart as possible on tanks. For main tanks and day tanks, when the vent pipe is extended a long distance, you must be careful not to exceed the pressure rating on that oil tank. For flood zone buildings, refer to Appendix G of the New York City Building Code for your storage limitations and UL 142 rated tanks are maximum 5 PSI static pressure rated. However, the New York City alternate tank design is rated for 25 PSI minimum. The New York City tank design allows 
the vent lines to be extended further and higher in elevation. This higher pressure rated tank must be used for installations with vent lines above 12 feet vertical or over 20 feet horizontal. Sub-basements and lower may require a higher pressure rated tank. So John, as you can see with the venting issue here, it's pretty difficult to use a UL 142 tank inside a building in New York City, isn't it? It is very difficult. Uh, you have to meet your code requirements and really the best application I feel for those types of tanks is uh, outdoors or at grade someplace uh, where you really are able to control the height of the vent line. This is a typical UL-142 belly tank and includes a working vent on the primary portion of the belly tank, one emergency vent on the primary, and one emergency vent on the basin side. All vent lines are combined and run to atmosphere. Note the overflow piped into the vent. Vent line is sized for vapor flow, overflow sized based on oil pump flow rate. So John, how do we decide that combined emergency vent in there? Well, typically we'll take the largest emergency vent fitting, which is typically on the rupture basin, and you're going to run that line out into your common. Your combined vent will be the largest fitting size, that diameter of that fitting, and that will be your common combined vent line. Day tank controls. Day tanks inside buildings can include an open top rupture basin for containment. Day tank level control consists of a multi-point level switch, pump on, pump off, with high and low level set points. As you see in the cutout, our low point is approximately 40% day tank capacity. This allows the facility some time to respond to the low level alarm. Tank basin will include a leak detection switch. Pump supply and overflow connections shall include drop tube connections in the tank to prohibit foaming. FYI, the device with the red cap is the weighted emergency vent. These are illegal for use and installation in New York City. If this inner tank here was a New York City built tank, we could just run one vent line off that, off that main tank. Obviously, the ruptured basin has an open top, so no need to vent that. Yeah, and that vent line would be, you know, depending on your day tank, is two to three inch diameter. Generators with a header system. Header is for use when day tanks are not practical. They are sized same as day tanks with a maximum allowable capacity of 330 gallons. This slide represents a double wall day tank that is required for outdoor installations. Indoor installations can use a single wall pipe with a containment basin. And your maximum supply pipe feeding this header is 4 inches in diameter. You will include leak detection, a foot valve for generator suction, and recommend a low level sensor as a backup. As you can see, there is a vacuum breaker in the return line piped to a drum. This drum will include a breather and a leak sensor. We recommend the inlet supply pipe and the return pipe be at opposite ends of the header so you can get full flow through the header. So John, is there any code requirement around that low level switch there? Yes, there is, Ed. Um, that switch is allowed to turn the pumps on only if the generator is in operation. So if the generator is off and they drained out the tank, the pumps will not start to fill that header. Well, that makes sense. Long-term storage of fuel oil is very critical for generators. Diesel fuel is an organic compound which can decay over time. Many data centers and building owners want a large amount of oil on site in case of Armageddon. Most generator systems are tested per NFPA 110 guidelines. This creates an issue as very little oil is consumed throughout the year and most generator manufacturers recommend a fuel oil maintenance system when the oil will not be turned over within six months to a year. The main issue with long-term storage of fuel oil 
is because tanks are vented to atmosphere, which allows condensation slash water into the tank. When this happens, the water ends up at the bottom of the tank. This creates a barrier level between the water and the oil, in which bacteria thrive and create a layer of sludge on the bottom of the tank. Where is the pump suction drop tube? At the bottom of the tank to get all the oil out. So this means that sludge is going to your generator. It's not good. Generators have a 10 micron filter that will clog and shut the generator down in the middle of the blackout. The solution is a fuel oil maintenance system. These both dewater the fuel and oil and filter down to 5 microns. We recommend a dedicated supply and return pipe on the opposite ends of the tank to ensure fuel oil turnover. We also recommend dedicated supply line to ensure the filtration system drop tube extends lower than the transfer pump supply drop tube. So Ed, with this bacteria interfacing with the water and the oil, I mean, how does that affect a steel tank? Well, steel tanks don't like that water down the bottom of them, that sludge. So yeah, there, there has been some premature failure of steel tanks, especially with those ultra low sulfur and bio biofuels. This is a typical fuel oil maintenance system. These are standard designs capable of filtering up to two 20,000 gallon tanks. A typical system will filter the sludge from oil down to five microns, remove water from the fuel, and a self-contained leak detection and alarm. Large custom skidded filtration systems used in systems of multiple tanks includes filtration to 5 microns, water removal, chemical treatment, automatic PLC controls for sequencing multiple tanks. And so Ed, looking at this large filtration unit here, you have a horizontal tank, and you've got this vertical tank with a hand pump, and then to the right of that, another cylindrical tank. Well, the cylindrical tank is where your filter cartridges are, actually are, with the uh, high pressure lit, with the ASME lid on it there. The uh, tank closest to us is a biocide tank, the horizontal tank, for injecting a biocide to help uh, stabilize your fuel or, or lengthen its uh, usability. And the big tank in the middle there, that's your water holding tank, your wastewater holding tank. Right. And, and that's where uh, you, know, you pump the old water out there and you hopefully uh, get rid of it per DEP guidelines. But hopefully you don't fill that tank up too much. No, if you fill that tank up too often, you may want to think about a new uh, fuel oil supplier. Nice. We have available a fuel oil systems program used for system design. This example is a typical New York City generator installation with a main fuel oil tank pump set located in the basement and the day tank located on the 10th floor. In this example, the pump suction is 14.25 inches mercury, which per our previous slide is less than 15 inches. Therefore, this system will operate without any issues. This is the output of our program that shows the primary pipe size, the piping friction losses, the fitting losses, valve losses, fluid velocity, and most important, the NPSHA and NPSHR. Example of a control system for our fuel system showing pump set control, tank gauging, leak detection, and overfill alarm. Fuel oil system controls can be as simple as a handoff automatic switch or as complex as a PLC-based system. The main advantage to the PLC is that they can talk to your building management system or a cloud-based system. So Ed, the, the, uh, you know, the BMS is great, but I think I see a trend towards uh, you know, internet cloud uh, monitoring. Well, sure, it's a great way to let your people know um, that there's a problem in the building versus having a call from a tenant. So they get a call from the cloud instead of tenant? Correct. These are typical shutdown conditions that we recommend. Uh, leak in the riser, leak in containment piping, leak in the day tank, leak in the pump set, loss of flow in the pump to protect the pump, uh, day tank high level, and oil in the vent line. The asterisk, the leak in the riser, uh, leak in the day tank, and day tank high level are code required shutdowns in New York City. New York City fuel oil code caveats. For day tanks above the lowest floor, you must have 200% containment. Your maximum is 330 gallons of storage per floor. UL-142 tanks requires both the operating and emergency vent lines terminated outdoors. New York City alternate tank design, 25 PSIG rated tank, 
requires its operating vent be terminated outdoors. Also, the New York City alternate tank design tank does not require an emergency vent. One day tank per pump set. Tanks in the basement over 660 gallons requires a means of spill containment at the fill box. All basement tanks are in a two hour fire rated room minimum. Riser pipe requires leak detection with pump shutdown logic. Anti-siphon valves are used on tanks when the inventory is above the pump inlet. A foot valve is required when the tank inventory is below the pump inlet. You'll have a leak in the riser piping uh, monitored with a drum. Fire valves are provided on the pump suction line and the inlet to the generator room and all fuel burning devices. Some parting rules of thumb. Thank you all for listening. Ed, great job. You too, John, also. If you have any questions, we will now go live uh, for your question and answer session. And if you have any detailed questions, please also feel free to email us directly. Thank you. Hey, we're Ed Twister here with the questions. Uh, the first question is, what is the purpose of the drum in the header application? Okay, so um, when a vacuum breaker is installed in the return line on a header system, First off, just to uh, premise, the vacuum breaker is there to break any vacuum created when the pump downstairs stops supplying oil. The return line, of course, still has oil in it, and that could create the vacuum and pull the oil out of the header. Uh, so you install a vacuum breaker to introduce air into the return line, um, and conversely, you have to pipe that into a drum in case for some reason the return line clogs and the oil goes up through the vacuum breaker, it must be contained with the drum. The drum will have a leak sensor in it, and that will shut off the pumps. And it also yeah. has a breather on it. Sorry about that. And it's also a code requirement in New York City to have that drum. Great. Next question is, is it safe to be overly conservative when sizing suction line on a pump skid? Sizing the suction piping is, is critical. Like if you size the pipe you know, too small, you're going to have too many friction losses, and you have problems getting the oil into the pump, and you're going to have cavitation. Um, if the pipe is too large, we're talking very small pumps here, gallons per hour, and it's very hard to prime a large pipe and to get that oil moving. So on the suction side, you um, typically I like the size for about two feet per second or less uh, fluid velocity in that pipe. All right. The next question is: How often should you recirculate fuel in an above ground and underground tank? Well, that's kind of a, there's a lot of variables. Um, you know, is there high moisture? Is it high sulfur fuel? I mean, there's a lot of variables with the oil, uh, with, the, with the location of your oil tank it could be outdoors. So you might see a lot more moisture. You see a lot more moisture perhaps in the spring um, as well. So uh, what we do is we recommend that if you don't turn the oil over in that tank uh, within we, we look at a, at least a year and a half, two years, but there are generator manufacturers who say six months. Um, so anything 2,000 gallons or greater, we recommend the filtration unit on there to help keep that oil's uh, longevity. <clears throat> um, another question is, what is, are the limitations to tank vent terminations in New York City, spacing to outdoors, windows, et cetera? As far as the vents, they, they must be extended to the outdoors. Um, spacing is three feet from three feet from any uh, building opening. Um, five feet from a subway. Five feet from a subway. And the vent has to be minimum two feet, maximum 12 feet above the fill port. Excellent. Uh, next question is, what is the max vacuum a pump can pull? Maximum vacuum is 20 inches. Um, we like to see the pump skids uh, sized and designed at a 15 inch or less uh, vacuum for uh, during their normal operation for longevity. 
Uh, you could at times get to 22 to 23 inches of vacuum on your pump, but uh, at that rate, it'll be uh, short-lived. Okay, next question is, why do you need an anti-siphon valve? You need an anti-siphon valve anytime the fluid level in your tank is above the center line of your pump. Reason being, if there was ever a leak then at the pump set or any of the lower piping, you would have the, you, know, you possibly could drain that 10,000 gallons of oil onto your, uh, your floor. Um, and likewise, since we're talking about uh, suction side of the pumps, if your tank happens to be below your pump inlet, then you would use a foot valve, and that foot valve is designed to uh, hold your prime and your suction line so that you won't have a flow failure every time that pump starts. Um, it looks like another question is, is there a limit on high height requirements for a fill alarm sign near the fill line? The fill, the, um, the fill alarm's got to be a fill alarm sign. I would just say keep it in the line of sight. Of sight yeah. yeah, you know, 20 feet, as long as you can read it. A lower one, too. Steve? Yeah. Steve asks, can you, can you get a belly tank with only the New York City tank? 25 PSI tag. I've only seen belly tanks with a 25 PSI tag and a UL 142 tags, and therefore inspectors require the belly tank to be vented as if it were a 142 tank. This is a, uh, a very good question, and the issue here is if you buy a generator package, that is a UL package, um, the generators have their own UL packaging, and, that, and anything on that generator must have a UL label. So if the belly tank is part of the generator package, you have to have the UL label on that tank. Um, and if you have a UL label on it, then the size of the vent, you must use the largest vent opening as your uh, size of your, uh, your vent termination. So if you had a two inch operating vent and a three inch uh, emergency vent on your main tank, then a four or five inch vent on the interstitial or outer basin, you have to run that four or five inch line up and out and you could combine all of them into one. That would be the common yeah. uh, diameter. But if you had a belly tank, a generator that's, you know, not, not a UL package, yes, you can get a 25 PSI rated only tank with that UL label on it. Right, and you can always get remote uh, day tanks that are alternate tank designs as well. All right, one other question is, what is the New York City code requirements for a vertical fuel oil riser? Um, another good Good question, but I uh, kind of like the answer maybe, but uh, if you, uh, inside the riser, you have to use a uh, you know, special 40 bolted pipe. Uh, it has to be in a masonry shaft made of four inch uh, concrete. You have to have four inches of spacing between the walls inside that riser. Now you can run multiple supply and multiple return pipes in the riser, going up into different uh, day tanks or, or belly tanks, but you have to keep your spacing within that riser. Um, if you have multiple risers with offsets, there's some rules around that also, but that might be another question. There's um, another uh, option nowadays also uh, for New York City uh, is the flexible pipe uh, that's been out on the market, and uh, that would only require a two-hour fire-rated uh, riser shaft as opposed to four-inch masonry. But that's also flexible. It's not just flexible pipe. It's double wall flexible pipe with continuous detection system in it. That's correct. So that has yes. to meet all those requirements in order to uh, use that. And that is something uh, that is approved for use in New York City. Um, did you did you answer the question? Um, what are the requirements for the horizontal fuel pipe as well? Uh, no, I thought there was another question. Yeah, that's why I didn't. That's, that's why I stopped with the riser. <laughs> Um, with horizontal piping, anytime you go above, once you leave the uh, pump room, you must be uh, within a, uh, the fuel supply and return pipes must be in a containment, a welded containment pipe, basically. And that must be in a you know, welded containment of at least minimum 10 gauge steel. And that must be also uh, in a fire rated chip. Um, uh, either a fire rated sheetrock enclosure, two hour rated, or it can be wrapped with a 3M endothermic wrap, um, multiple layers of a wrap. Now, if you go more than 25 feet horizontal between risers, you must have a leak sensor at every vertical riser that's more than 25 feet apart. Horizontal risers? Well, 
if there's more than 25 feet horizontally between the risers. Right. Yeah, you must have a leak sensor at each riser. Okay, it looks like we got a, a few other questions. Um, and if we don't get to your question, feel free to email John and Ed, and they will um, be able to help you out with any um, problems or questions you guys have. Um, Alex looks like he asked, since the return pumps are not allowed, how is the day tank level sensor testing performed effectively in New York City? You pull the sensor out of the tank, unfortunately. Right, and that's monthly. So that's all I'll work. Yeah, you got to pull it out and actually probe it. That's correct. Uh, that's a lot. <clears throat> uh, another question is, does the fuel oil piping supply slash return need to have a two-hour enclosure when routed horizontally on the roof? On the rooftop, it has to be double wall, but it does not have to be fire rated. However, you do have to run that line up to within five feet of the uh, oil device, whether it's a belly tank, a remote day tank, or a header next to the generator. You can go single wall for the last five feet to put your, right. your fire safety you down need in, threaded pipe, in your right. shuttle pipe, in your shuttle valve. And also, if you have uh, a remote day tank or a remote header and you're uh, more than five feet away from the generator, you're going to have to double wall that piping as well between the header and the uh, day uh, generator. Or seven feet. Okay. Um, David, it looks like yes. Can you show the last screen of the program rules of thumb? Thanks. Yeah, we'll be able to put those up. Uh, just give us a little bit, and we'll put them up. Um, John, Ed, do you guys have any closing comments on on the webinar? Anything you'd like to add? Um, I just like to thank you guys both for being able to make it here. And um, like I said, if anyone has any further questions, please feel free to email John and Ed. Um, they have their email right up on the screen, and they'll be able to answer any questions you have. Um, yeah, it was uh, was fun doing this, and I hope to do uh, more down the road. And uh, we are always available for lunch and learns with you, your uh, engineering firm in New York City and uh, New Jersey. Hey, okay. oh, yes, I think I said it all, John. But we thank you for your time <laughs> and. Um, Again, yeah, we hope to uh, start doing a few more of these, and uh, you know, that's it. Give us a call. Give us a call. All right, thank you.